This is Hunt Nebraska, the official podcast for insight into Nebraska's hunting and shooting sports community. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, our space for sharing stories, information, tips, and techniques. Now, Hunt Nebraska. And (laughs) we're back. It's red. We're back. No, we got to throw out a big uh, welcome to Outdoor Nation. Thanks for joining us. However, you might be listening or watching us, give us a subscribe. Make sure you you help us out and spread the word of all the good things happening here in the state of Nebraska. Real quick, we got Jeff Rawlinson. He's with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. We got Kayla Gaddikin for well for just a little bit longer. Kayla, couple months, couple months before she comes uh, back with an alias. She's pushing the buttons, making us sound good on the editing end, and we've got. Jackson Ellis, our education coordinator, along uh, for the ride today and the hangout here at the Hunt Nebraska Cabin. Me, I'm just Hershey. Now we're going to jump into it. It's been a while since we've been in here. It is the meeting of, you know, time to meet, season for conferences, for summits, for all that type of stuff. So we we got to kind of check in, see what you guys have, have been up to. I know, Kayla, you snuck in one more ice fishing trip since the last time we... I did. You got to take advantage of those cold, cold days that provide you with ice. It was a quick, quick ice season. It was a it quick, was very yeah. quick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was impressed. You got probably the last day of ice fishing that on record. Had to the, be. Had to be. I, had the to ice be. was pretty sketchy. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I've got to say, I had written it off completely. Just, yeah. yep, no, don't venture out there. And all of a sudden, we get a Snapchat, folks, from yeah. Kaylee's like, one more day. One I knew there was four <laughs> inches of ice in some places, but I didn't know it too many places, that's that, for sure. That spud stick did not leave our sides. For I can long. imagine it did not. <laughs> no, I got to say, that's pretty good. How many inches of ice did you have on that last day? Oof. Um, I'd inches. say, yeah, four Maybe three in some spots, There's two some if folks, yeah, you got yeah. out to the middle. Yeah, don't yeah. go any further than that. Yeah, I'm getting dizzy already. Stop. Yeah. yeah. Most of the time, I, I like I said, I'd already written off ice season um, at the point that, that you went out. My end of ice fishing usually happens when all of a sudden you go out, you know, 15, 20 yards from the shore, and you, you go either with the spud bar or your, your hand auger and just check that ice, and it's, whoa. <laughs> Back to the truck. Season's <laughs> over. That spud bar can yep. be your friend. Yeah. I can tell you that right now. It can be your worst enemy, too, but <laughs> that thing's pretty darn important. Yeah. The one thing I will say is make sure you have a lanyard on it so it's around your hand as well, <laughs> so when it goes through, it doesn't keep going. Uh, uh, how deep's the ice? I don't know, but I can tell you the pond's <laughs> deeper than about three feet. I can give you that much. Now, Jackson, you're kind of our resident shed hunting guru i mean it's not that the rest of us don't look it's not that the rest of us don't find but you travel out of state sometimes looking for sheds i mean this is kind of you might you might like the shed hunting a little bit more than you do even the regular hunting season yeah i can bring home more antlers (laughs) (laughs) good point he's into it he's he's writing books about it i'd say that's pretty into it so how's the season gone pretty good it won't be our best year i'll tell you that it's been all right but uh, it's still going on now. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're still looking. The I, snow. I, the snow tonight might might kind of screw with things. I was planning on making a weekend out of this, but we'll see what happens. You know, I was down in Mound City over the weekend. I still saw antlers on the hoof. Really? Yes. Yes. I wow. thought that was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. I've seen them into into April. Mm-hmm. I have seen tur- been out turkey hunting I've and seen, seen deer sporting pretty nice racks. Yeah. Yep. I've I've seen two about this point. I think this yeah. is probably about the latest I've yeah, seen. The one, norm is the norm have dropped. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. For yep. sure. You found a pretty good pair here recently. Yeah. 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 Now my the dog my dog ha- helped me match one up. Yep. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. How cool is that? You gotta love it. Yep. See, and I'll, a little bit of my shed hunting experience recently is uh, started like you said, a few weeks back and, and found some small ones, to be quite honest with you. But my brother and I were out about a week ago or so on a, a nice warm day and uh, really didn't have much luck until we kind of, all right, we're going to put a trail camera right here on this on this uh, nice beaten path and just see what's going on and see if they're still carrying and all that type of stuff. Got the trail camera set up. And uh, we were just to that point where it was on the tree, but we have to make sure that it's going to pick up movement on that that trail. And it's got that nice little red light that blinks or whatever it is to yep. let you know, yep, I'm getting you, I'm getting you. And uh, started up and down that trail, got within about a foot and a half of a really nice shed. <laughs> and it didn't even dawn on me. I just looked, oh, what's that? And I picked it up and like, wow. <laughs> and it's one of those things you, you kind of get to that point when you're walking those woods this time of year and you think I can see forever. Right, and you get up on those high points, and you're looking, look, no sheds down there, and you're looking a hundred yards away or seventy yards away. No, nope, no, nope, not not going that direction. 
I got within a foot and a half without seating a oh, good yeah. size mm-hmm. antler. So fast forward to uh, just this last weekend on Sunday, I was on that mentality. Don't look past 10 feet. Make sure I'm looking over here. I'm just going to cover this entire area. Found two sheds, and you could see them from 40 yards away. Yeah. One was just shining. It had fallen where the, the tines were down, which I thought was kind of interesting for whitetails. Um, down in the, the ridge, the curve of it. You oh, could see it from a long ways, the sun mm-hmm. reflecting off of it. And the second one was right out in the pasture. I mean, there wasn't any grass taller than about three inches, and it's just laying right there. And I... I wasn't even going to walk out that direction, but what's that? <laughs> Boom. No problem. So shed hunting to me is about as aggravating as looking for morels, Jeff. Yeah. Because either you find them and you think, I got this solved. There's no nothing to this. Or you just keep searching and searching. And, and sometimes the harder you look, the less you find. Well, we always tell people, you know, look for those areas where deer are crossing creeks or look for those low spots where they're going mm-hmm. over, over fences that jostle those. But then... You find antlers, it's out in the middle of the field. Yep. You're like, well, why did they fall off here? Exactly. He had to jump three fences to get to this field. They didn't fall off there, but he put his head down to eat some corn and pop right off. Yep. So it doesn't make sense sometimes. And, and you know, the, the thought is, like you said, match pairs, usually they're going to lose them pretty close to each other. They can. I haven't seen that in some time. So I'm guessing there's some one antler deer running yeah. around some of these areas. But definitely kind of fun because, yep, get out there early, before, especially in spots where other people might be looking as well. Uh, but you got to keep checking. And yep. this was a spot that we had walked before a couple of weeks ago and found a couple of small ones. And now, same area, two bigger ones. Yep. So. Yep. It's, it's, it's frustrating sometimes, to say oh. the least. But, but when you find them? Oh. Victory dance. The, yeah. You do the yippee dance, don't you? Yep. Yep. I stop and get a picture of just about every one now. I try I to. I don't get it out very often, but it's just kind of neat just seeing how it, boom, it's right there. Just like you said, so nine times out of ten, you're like, you're just walking along, and then you happen to look down, and boom. Yeah. And you're like, how did I even walk up this close to it without seeing it? Well, I'll have to show you the picture of this one, but my brother, who was also there with me when I found uh, the one as we were hanging the trail camera, he was just kind of watching what I was doing and also kind of helping here and there. And he was probably within three foot of it, but there was a bottle, just a plastic water bottle sitting beside it. And he saw him, saw that there, and he thought, oh, I better go pick that up. And he saw me bending over, and he's like, oh, Aaron's got it. <laughs> I did not pick up the water bottle. I picked up this this antler and held it up, and I'm just like, whoa. And so there's two of us. Do what we're looking for. Still didn't see it for what it was worth. That's a good point, though. Anytime I'm out, I've got a trash bag. Oh, I, I pick up pick lots up trash. of trash. Yeah, yeah. Good it's for a you. great time. For you. A great time to kind of clean up and and pick up. I some can't trash. imagine being out in the outdoors and you're done drinking a bottle of water and I just toss. It. I got nothing to do with this. I just toss it. I just yeah. I, that mentality. I just will never understand. There's, no, there's Slob, some of that. Slobby. I'm guessing that some of it too is if you've got a pickup truck, it's not as secure of a spot to toss things into the bed. Uh, mm-hmm. as you might think, and, and uh, with roads and the wind that blows here in the Great Plains, that some of that just kind of shows up. But you're right. There are some folks oh, that... That's fair, ooh, but when I find it in the go. middle of a section... Yeah, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> cans, cans aren't blowing in the middle of a section, so no, no, it's it's uh, it's just a way of thinking. So, it's a mentality, and, it, and it's unfortunate. Well, I, I'm all right. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I got things yeah, you to might, say. You might need to be more <laughs> I will bring cognizant one about thing, uh, uh, trespassing. I've, I've already found four balloons this year. So that's oh, actually no. one of the, the things I find a lot of. That <laughs> and we'll be stopping me. there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We can move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let's get into Those slogans. are acceptable. <laughs> yeah. Something else I know that, uh, Jeff, well, all three of you, I think, have, have done just a little bit uh, recently, snow goose hunting. Our spring conservation order is open through, uh, I believe, uh, way into April. Yep. But we're seeing some influx of birds right now and, and uh, fun discussion about whether we've seen the big push already or if that's coming yet. Uh, I think that's part of waterfowl hunting. You're always, always hoping there's more, but you're always nervous that there isn't. Yep. Uh, so what are you guys experiencing? Jeff, you were a little bit further south, well, so we'll start with yours. Yeah, I want to know what you think. Have the birds pushed through for the bulk yet, or you think there's still birds coming through? I, I think we're kind of right in the middle. Yeah. I think it's. Yeah. I think the end is coming yeah. quick. Yeah. Um, I think there are some birds that are past us. Yeah. 
I think a lot of birds have come past us. Mm-hmm. But, I, okay. Yeah. No, we've we've seen birds, seen healthy populations. We've been seeing them for well over a week now. And uh, last week, when with that warm weather, we saw a lot of birds come through. Yeah, and uh, we were down in southeast Nebraska and even into Missouri near near um, uh, Les Bluffs. And, uh, you know, not as many birds down there as I would have thought we would have seen. Still plenty. But, you know, in years past, we've seen a lot more than plenty, right? And so, uh, so I, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's been good hunting, but, uh, you know, not like it has been in years past maybe. But uh, I, I think when we were down there and then uh, over the last week when I was, we were conferences and meetings and we couldn't get out hunting, uh, I think there was a lot of birds coming overhead. I think I know there's a couple of lakes on, I'll say on the outskirts of Lincoln that uh, they're loaded up right now. There's yeah. a lot of people just stopping and looking. Yeah. 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 And, and again, you know, the head of this front that, that's coming in today and mm-hmm. tomorrow, I, you know, I could see some fun hunting you know going on here so yep yeah they won't be moving a whole bunch more during it or right before it necessarily uh but uh it, yeah it'd be kind of interesting i know they're just starting to see uh sandhill cranes kind of show up in numbers in the central part of the area usually um hey when when the snow geese come and then the dark geese come the, the cranes are really close behind them, but they're yeah. not yeah. Not no, here we yet. Haven't, we haven't so, de- seen the, the bulk of the cranes by any means. Yeah. No. So it'll it'll be interesting to see what happens. We've we're on that roller coaster that we call March weather, and and yeah. it looks like it stabilizes a little bit. So we'll have a really good idea of if most of the birds have already passed us by, or uh, there's a bunch yet to come over the next week or so. So you brought up cranes. What is what's the furthest east you've ever seen cranes before? Oh, good question. Now let's qualify that okay. furthest east in Nebraska. Yes, yeah. yeah. For the season, okay, far Florida. Out. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gonna yeah. say quite east side of Florida. Was, was yeah, I'd, I'd never seen him too far. I, I'd never seen him probably east of Lincoln, and we were closer, to, well, much closer to Omaha this last weekend. And we while you were snow goose hunting, yeah, while you were snow goose hunting, and look up, and there's ten of them right above us. No kidding. Mm. Yeah. Well, right. I, I, I've seen them in Lincoln, but I guess yeah. I've never. They could have been east of Lincoln. I've never seen them. East I mean, of Lincoln I'm sure either. they are, but I've just it, it was yeah. kind of something I don't. Wow. Huh. So years ago, when we had our blind down by Eagle, Nebraska, which is just uh, just um, outside, of, just east of Lincoln there, and uh, we had a sandhill crane that just hung around the blind. I mean, and it wasn't like it couldn't fly. And I think it was a juvenile, but it wasn't like it couldn't, it was a juvenile, but it wasn't like it couldn't fly because it would fly off and go eat in the cornfield. And then it'd come flying back, you know, and there's days it'd fly off and leave the section and then it'd come flying back. But just about every morning we'd go down there to start putting, you know, we'd leave a lot of decoys out in the field, goose decoys. And he'd be standing right there next to some of those. And he had a couple favorite goose decoys that he'd be standing by. And uh, there'd be times we'd be cooking breakfast in the blind. You look out and there he is right beside the blind, just looking in just you know what's, what's for breakfast guys well and here's another question um the times that i've probably seen them further east in the state of nebraska it's usually been the fall mm. and it's just like you said small groups is, and you yeah. can hear more than anything else mm-hmm. spring it really seems like they tend to bottleneck even more there yeah. through the central platte valley so that crane that you were hanging out was that in the fall or in the spring that was a fall and spring or into early spring and then it moved on. Yeah, but it was it was probably you know not no not spring probably January was the latest it stayed. So um, interesting fall. That really is interesting. That's the fun thing about wildlife, isn't it, Kayla? They always break the rules. As yeah. soon as we say this is what they're going to do, all of a sudden. Well, boom, the first they, time we saw uh, him, we named no. him Herman because he needed a name, right? So yeah. we named him Herman, and uh, he kind of came the mascot. I mean, you know, the first time we saw him, we're like, oh, how cool is that? Then the next day we go out, and there he was again. Oh, that's cool. And you know, month later, it's like, I wonder if Herman will be there today. You know, he will. Sure enough, <laughs> Herman's there. Yeah, and uh, he'd make some funny sounds, some funny calls every once in a while to us. It was just we got to know him pretty well. He was a pretty, pretty cool bird. But then all of a sudden, one day he was gone, and we never saw him again. Well, you do take notice when. You, you're not in the traditional mm-hmm. crane area here in Nebraska because that was something when I moved here, it kind of shocked me is, all right, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of cranes pass through the Central Platte area? So you're thinking, well, you know, some of them are going to be kind of antisocial. I know they like to flock up more than herons or some other uh, shore birds, uh, wading birds, that type of stuff. But you assume, well, East of Grand Island, you, you're going to see a few, but you don't. In the mm-hmm. springtime, oftentimes it's you got to get yeah. west of Grand Island, and then all west. of a sudden they're yeah. everywhere. And then all of a sudden 
there's a line to the west, and yeah. you don't hardly see a one again. Yeah, yep. yeah. You, you usually got to go past Grand Island, and then all of a sudden you really get into the cranes. And then as you get, you know, that Cozad Lexington area, it starts mm-hmm. it starts to fade pretty fast. Yeah, and uh, but that is the the center zone right there, and I mean they are beefing up, and they will be beefing up over the next several weeks there. And what a place to beef up! That's a buffet line. It'd be like me going to a buffet line. We're gonna stay a while. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna stay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, back to Snogie. So how big a spreads were you guys sitting in how many decoys rags oh. bags silhouettes full bodies shells so, whatever it is so this was full we were in a, in a field so it was full bodies and socks and i'm gonna this is a guess i didn't say this wasn't my spread so and, that's and all I, right to, to be honest i didn't ask which is usually a question i ask now that i think about it so. <laughs> well you were busy cooking and looking at the picture yeah I, I was i was chef um but I, i'm guessing about two thousand 2000. All right. Probably. Eastern Nebraska. Jeff? Yeah. Well, you know, my spread back here in uh, south of Lincoln is a, a few hundred. But uh, the spread we were in last <laughs> weekend, uh, again, not my spread, but a gentleman who does this pretty well, pretty good at it. Yeah, we were probably in that two to 3,000 range. Uh, Isn't that impressive? I think for a Canada hunter like myself, anytime you get 200 decoys out there, just like, wow. Well, and wow. what's impressive is setting up that spread so that those birds always center up right in front of the shooters. And I mean, you know, we, we congregate the, the, the birds around us uh, laying on the ground there, but there wasn't a bird that came in that, you know, might swing around a few times, but when they came in to land, they came centered right up, right in the center, See, coming right into the, right behind. Again, us, I think that's another impressive. difference with snow geese, to yeah. be quite honest with you. I think Canada's oftentimes, uh, when you're hunting them in the fall, they're looking for those open spots. They're looking, uh, snow geese, I think they kind of figure out where the mass of birds are. Uh, and I think that's where amassing a whole bunch of decoys, perhaps around the the hide, the blind, whatever it is, kind of helps where it hurts, I think, in, in chasing cannabis, to be quite honest with you. Yep. Uh, if you drive down the road here in Nebraska in the fall, especially, and look out at the actual geese, yeah, there's going to be some concentrations, but you're going to see them spread out quite a bit. If you look at the decoy spreads for Canada geese, it gets a really dark right there around the layouts or around the pit blind or whatever it is, and then it kind of um, uh, spreads out a little bit on the edges where snow goose, you hide right underneath those, right? I mean, yep. you're talking yep. tall bags. You were in a pit blind, mm-hmm. uh, but I assume there were some decoys maybe on the, the yep. lids and, and the right around that and stuff. But, but again, I think it, it, it kind of talks more to snow geese do kind of come from a little bit higher. Yep, they still got to drift down to you. But can of geese, I mean, they have a long approach. It's more of a horizontal than a, a yeah. vertical descent. That's yeah. a great way to, to yep. say it. So, so what do you guys experience? I mean, you guys both got shots of geese, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Yep. We we saw a ton. I mean, we we watched. If it, if you were a bird watcher, you were having a great day. Uh, <laughs> it was very a very frustrating day. Which is snow goose hunting is very frustrating. If you're easily frustrated <laughs> yeah, and you and you and you go off on that, you're not gonna have I, a good time. I find it relaxing hunting. and reset the clock. We had Zen moment. We had one flock. I mean. I couldn't tell you how many birds, and they started to do that just classic, classic Ooh, tornado. tornado. Yeah. And uh, at one point, we were like, you know, one more pass. Like they're <laughs> they're right at that, you know, fifty, <laughs> sixty yard mark. We're like, here it is, and they did that one more pass, and we're like. They're 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 higher than they were last time. Like, watch the next pass. Saying, the next pass, they're a little higher. And the next thing you know, they're the just going. Same thing. They're like, one more pass, and we're in range. Make a decision, Bobby. One more pass. <laughs> oh, okay, we're going back. No, uh, that that's the frustrating part. Yes. Yeah. I mean, because we see that now. Most of ours were dive bombers. You know, groups of two and three just coming right in, and a lot of them we saw them coming in from way off to the south, and they were just just locked in, coming right into us, and just getting right up right up and personal. But uh, that's the frustrating part with snows because you those big flock we would always say at our when we're hunting them we'd rather see four or five than four or five hundred or four or yep. five thousand because mm-hmm. those four or five thousand that's a lot of eyes and what's the average lifespan of a snow goose it's it's you know you know I mean, double digits they get yeah, banded 12, I mean, they get 13 years so this ain't their first rodeo right no. so they've seen this before they've been shot at and so uh that's a lot of experience in those eyes looking at you yep. but you bring up a great point i do think for any aspiring spring snow goose chaser You've got to ask yourself, one, do I like watching birds? Because that's that's probably what you're going to do. And there's some cool things going on with the migration. And two is, do I enjoy horseshoes and hand grenades? Yeah. Getting close, is that a fun thing? Because there's a lot of times, even some of those big flocks uh, tease you just a little mm-hmm. bit. 
they'll be moving along and then all of a sudden they see your spread and they just kind of hook Float just back. a little bit and then and disappear. So you're just, they, they get the heart going. They know you they're to trying be, to test you. To be a waterfowler and especially a spring snow goose waterfowler, you have to enjoy the suck. You have to really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you got to have you, endurance, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you got to enjoy those days where, yeah, we saw 10,000 birds. Did you get one? <laughs> Yeah, we saw 10,000 birds. Yeah. You know, there, there's no question about it. You know, we, we often lament them when we're watching them. They're just sitting there. They made 10, 11 passes. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, this isn't going anywhere, guys. You know, but you, you think, well, what are they thinking? I, I know what they're thinking. They're like, oh, there's a cooler. All right, another pass. Oh, there's, there's a, is that a short, fat kid right there? Yeah, that's a short. Oh, another pass. Oh, there's another cooler. They're just picking everything out of your spread. I just know that's what they're doing. You'd think every once in a while one goose or two would just fall out of the air just from exhaustion with that many times circling and that much of I'd get dizzy. i just like, does. you know, they don't seem to be bothered by it. No, that. they. I think they enjoy it. I really do. And that's why they sometimes you'll just, boy, they almost sound like they're laughing up there. I mean, they're, there are no white fronts in that at all. My but then, then you get one bird that teases you that, that's like, oh, these birds aren't that smart. A uh, great example, we took a 45-minute break, went into town, grabbed some Subway, came back. There was a snow goose in the spread. We shot it. <laughs> no, no collars. Well, a couple of the, a couple of the, the blind so lids were up. Happen. It can happen. It's, it, uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. We, so, so why do you have it when there's ten thousand birds and one just decides to come yeah. in? And then you have what I call quite the dilemma because you got ten thousand birds circling and one comes in and you're thinking, hmm. hmm. I, you better I shoot do. it. I <laughs> yeah. And here's what the experienced sage old snow goose hunter tells you. Take the bird. Yep. Yeah. I, I definitely think it was a snow gooster, that, a snow goose chaser that came up with the, the phrase, one and then the hand is worth yep. two be. in the bush. Got to yep. be. Got to yep. be. And every time we throw at them, they adapt. I mean, it takes them about a week now to learn. You know, it, it used to be years. Now it's about a well, week. They got to figure it out. And, and we talked about it. Uh, our very own Mark Vertiska, Dr. Mark Vertiska, who's with UNL now, used to be the program manager for our waterfowl here in the state of Nebraska. Uh helped uh, with some research on snow geese and those that do decoy, especially in the springtime, how their fitness isn't quite the same. It's not the average. They're below, uh, I believe it's uh, the proteins, the lipids, the fats, that type of stuff, uh, as they migrate uh, back north. And there might be something to be said that they're hungrier. They're in a little bit less uh, health-wise. Uh, their shape is uh, not what it needs to be, and they're more likely to be duped into to coming down to the spread and like uh, you were talking about earlier this week jackson it's kind of doesn't matter if uh, everyone's well fed and and uh, all it takes is one if he decides that there's food and i need it yep they're coming down a lot there's a reason that snow, a serious snow goose hunter watches the uh the hatching report from the mm-hmm. year before the more young birds on the landscape the better chance that the young birds are leading that flock coming down um and the hunt can be better because if it's the adult birds leading that flock no chance. Good yeah. luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. It gets really tough from there. Now, Kayla, not to leave you out because we know you have some snow goose hunting experience, and you don't mess with a thousand and thousands of decoys. No, that's way too expensive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you usually use one. Not even. Well, it's, it might not be goose shaped. Oh, it's yes, it's kind of yep. like a, a cow. Yep. Well, uh, actually, this year I haven't used it yet, but Uh-oh. I have been out in the field chasing geese which is kind of an interesting take on it. So, yeah. Well, let's hear about it. Don't, don't hide cow. it. Yeah. Behind a cow. Behind a cow. Um, that's how we usually do it. But um, this year we were headed out to my parents for my fiancé's birthday party, and there were thousands of geese in this field, so we made a pit stop, talked to the <laughs> landowner, who I know since it was in Seward County. And, nice. Um, they're like, yeah, go for it. We didn't have any shotguns, didn't have anything, but we had the dog. And so it was a training opportunity oh. that we used more so oh, than oh. anything. So, so you hit behind on. the dog or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you're losing uh, yeah, so you're gonna go you found yep. they're on the pond? They're in a, field? a field. In a field. Yep. Feeding. You stop to ask, how does that go? Yep. We'd like to uh, hunt those geese. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, help yourself. We don't have any shotguns. So uh, we knocked on the door, and the owners, um, it was just Mary who was home. And so I talked to Mary and said, hey, you got a bunch of geese. I have a new puppy, and I would like to get him out just to see geese, feel the chase. Yeah. Um, we don't have any shotguns. We're not planning on hunting. 
Because these geese are maybe 10, 15 yards from their house. And oh, she said, wow. oh, okay, well, uh, sure, but, you know, what's your game plan? So I told her <laughs> we're going to go through the ditch and, um, like, just run, let the dog run after them and teach them steadiness when seeing those birds, all that excitement. And so that's exactly what we did. They were moving from the southeast to the northwest, just jumping as they're feeding. And so we walked behind her house she has kind of a shelter belt we hid in the shelter belt and then crawled through the ditch with the dog wow. and then we let the dog kind of come up above the ditch so he could see the birds and that's when it got fun because you could just <laughs> see the excitement run through him of oh my goodness i get to chase him can i chase let's go let's go let's go um but just teaching him that steadiness to stay yeah. wow. stay that's, back and not that's chase impressive. That and is. then eventually letting them run and just seeing that excitement and that tail or more so the butt move back and forth <laughs> yeah. as he's looking around as these thousands of geese take to the air so I, i'm a little afraid to ask but i got to because <laughs> our listeners are wanting to know how close did you get to him did we get to him mm-hmm um, we were probably... Specifically the dog. Yeah. <laughs> the well, do- either one, I want to yeah. know without yeah. shotguns, I want to yeah. know how close you got to them. Yep, I would say we were maybe 10, 15 feet away from them. We wow. were just wow. sitting in the ditch That's and impressive. they were just jumping. <laughs> we, we weren't trying to scare them, we were just letting the dog sit and watch. And I'm pretty sure Jaeger got some tail feathers. He was really close, <laughs> especially those yeah. ones in the back. <laughs> That Man. didn't quite understand what was going on. <laughs> but they knew they weren't going to like it. So the, was it just like a big white explosion? When oh, yeah. Was, and, and the and funny thing is, there? is Jaeger is white and black. So he looks really <laughs> close to specs. Yeah. So when you're watching him run, Disappear. yep, he almost disappears. So how many geese are we talking? Thousands. We I'd say there may be 15 feet. See, and we yep. didn't even get a Snapchat. I it know. Was, <laughs> it was too much excitement. See, you you yeah. just knew since they didn't have shotguns and weren't going to hunt them, you knew that they were going to get right up. Oh, yeah. Oh, Those yeah. geese yep. know. They, they know. That's pretty impressive. But that uh, wow. season goes on. What a challenge. What an opportunity, though, here in the state of Nebraska to get out and spend some time, especially on the warm days. Those seem to be, get a south breeze, those seem to be pretty darn good. Uh, switching gears completely. I'm going to put in a plug for this, and then we're going to get into a completely different topic. We've got a lot of things happening here in the we gotta catch uh, up. We gotta catch state up. of uh, Nebraska in the, in the month of March. One, folks, if you aren't uh, subscribed to Nebraska Land Magazine, you should be. You can find this on the, the shelf though, at the local magazine store. Uh, March 22, Jeff. This is pretty cool. You've you've seen this. We've talked about it with its author, uh, Justin Haig. New Life for the Old Stevens, yeah. where he talks about uh, restoring a gun that his grandfather had and what it all meant. Have you guys ever restored a gun? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, I haven't. I have not. Jeff, I know you I have. have. I have. I had an old 7mm Mauser rifle uh, at one point, and I did everything wrong that you can do. If you can say this, don't do this. I'm, you read the books. Says, Whatever you do, don't do this. So I did that. And uh, so I had to restore it almost twice. But uh, and then some odds and end guns that I bought over the years that need a little fixing or a little TLC. But this one's cool, though. This is really neat because, you know, for so many of us, a firearm has something to do with nostalgia for, for our family, right? And uh, to, to, to have that history, that nostalgia in your family, he's got, you know, the pictures, memories, whatever. And then to have that gun that was part of somebody else's livelihood, you know, for a long time, handed down to you to restore it to where new life for that gun so that your kids now can get it. it it's, it's pretty darn cool, if you ask me. I, well, I, I like that. These guns were made to last. I mean, they were really built, especially the guns of the 60s and 70s and, and that type of stuff. Not that some aren't nowadays. Uh, there's a little yeah. bit more pressed parts and, yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, manufacturing tricks and stuff that uh, uh, they put in there. And I don't know that we have the same affinity for all the guns that we end up with by any means. We're sometimes seen more of a tool than, a, than an heirloom. But at the same token, there are guns out there that have a lot of life in them left. And we yeah. might have some in our cabinets. I've got an old, um, well, my first fire, I'm a, an old Mossberg 22 semi-automatic uh, that feeds shells right through the wooden buttstock to, mm-hmm. to load the magazine. And, oh, I love that gun uh, growing up. And it probably needs a little TLC. Uh, and it's it's kind of kind of gives you some good hope for being able to do that, even as a, a uh, amateur, because there's not a lot of gunsmiths around. Yeah. 
No, no, they're not. And 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 honestly, I think the 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 deal here is this is this is from grandpa. Then it went to my dad. Then it goes to me. Um, you know, doing that yourself, making that restoration yourself, I think that just adds a little more to it. If you ask me, I think that adds a little more flair to the to the entire thing. But you know, there's so many. You hit the nail on the head, Hershey. Some of these guns are made the last, especially the guns, and firearms that have been made in the last you know 60, 70. 80 years, uh, they were made to last. And a lot of hand fitting, a lot of hand working on those parts. And, uh, you know, you got a lot of them that have been handed down that, you know, they don't look great, but they still function. And a little work on the stock, maybe a rebluing, and I mean, they can look almost as good as new. And, and again, it's about now that now that you've done that work, might cost you 80 bucks to restore, mm-hmm. it might cost you a little more, depending on the firearm. Then you can hand it down to your child and their grand. That, that firearm, just keep, it's just kind of a cool deal. There's something me. super cool about really an heirloom is. gun. There I mean, is. You know, I've, I've got a few from my dad, and uh, and, and they will be handed down to my, to my daughter. I'm not sure you know what what she'll do with them but uh i think she knows what they mean to me and so i think that they mean something to her my brother-in-law he's had he comes from the east the eastern united states you know and big deer camps the the the, kind of the home the pennsylvania connecticut area where those big deer camps uh were made famous and his family did a lot of that and he hunted with his grandfather and his uncles for many many years and they've passed on and they've handed him down some of their rifles and shotguns and and uh, it's been a big deal for him he's got rifles now that uh, uh, he'll never let go. Maybe his daughter will have them someday, but they have a lot of meaning. And uh, I've been at those deer camps where some of the cousins now sit around talking stories about that rifle that grandpa had or that rifle that their uncle had. And they remember the day they all went to the sporting goods store. Uh, the three cousins, or the three, they were cousins, their uncles, went to the sporting goods store to all buy the same rifle. They all wanted to get a 742 Woods Master back in the 60s, and they did. And, uh, Kind of, that's kind of cool. I mean, yeah. you just, I felt, I mean, it wasn't even my family and I'm listening to those stories and I felt taken in just a little bit. And it's all because of that rifle that was sitting there, uh, you know, uh, by the wood pile where we were sitting by the bonfire. Yeah, and, um, you know, that's kind of neat. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of old guns that just have character. Even when you see them on the, the uh, rack there at the sporting goods store, you can look at them and how many, how many mallards is that old uh, Model 12 yeah, mm-hmm. brought down or that old humpback A5 or, or what have you? A lot, of, a lot of nostalgia. Folks, check that out if you're into firearms. It's a, it's a good read. Neat pictures uh, there with his grandfather as well. We're not going to get into it this time, but I did see dun, 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 the 22 turkey guides are officially out and hard copies. They've been online for a little while. Turkey season's just weeks away, Jackson. Uh, 25th with uh, archery season. Uh, and then uh, in April for the rest of us with shotguns and all that, that good stuff should be a decent year. We're not going to cover anything more on that because that's a whole show unto its own, getting ready for that. And I know we'll, we'll I think do after well. we hunt the Ellis Ranch, we're going to have to do a show. But I think this is the year. <laughs> oh. I think this is the year we get to uh, hunt the Ellis go. Ranch. On location. Well, we haven't yet. So I'm just thinking this could be the On year. location. Yeah. I will yeah. toss this out there. And yes, Jackson, we've got to go there. Gas prices. And we're Not fortunate bad. fortunate here in the uh, in Nebraska that we've got some great turkey hunting, just about any county you get into for the most part. Now, there's some Sandhill counties you might have to search a little bit, but when you find them, they might be might be the mother load you've been, been looking for. Uh, is this, if these gas prices go into the spring, and I don't know why they wouldn't, unfortunately. I'm no analyst, so don't take my word for it. I'm, I hope I'm wrong. Is that going to cut into your spring turkey hunting? It may, I, I may not venture as far, but it's, it's not going to cut into my turkey time. It's going to cut into my turkey wallet. <laughs> <laughs> the distance? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anybody here that was planning on going out to uh, western Nebraska or northern Nebraska to chase turkeys? It was, there, there was a thought in my mind, definitely. And it, depending on where we're at in the next couple of months, it was a strong flame, and now it's just kind of flicking, but it's still there. It's still there. It's yeah, still there. It's still, it won't impact my turkey hunting. I mean, I might cut out food and electricity, but it won't, it won't <laughs> impact my turkey hunting, no. Not a, not a chance. Not a chance. Did you have any big trips planned? You know, we keep talking about wanting to head out to the Pine Ridge, do a turkey hunt. We've got connections out there, and we keep talking about doing that. Nothing real serious. Uh, Maxwell area, the, the Maxwell-Brady area is one area I'd like to get back to. Keep talking about making a hunt out of that. If we decide to do it, gas prices won't won't be the factor. Well, if we're going to decide to do it, we're going to do wow. it. Um, so, but, but that's, you know, th- well, that's more about having the, the right time, the amount of time you need to get out and do those things. But no, uh, it won't. But I will say this. I, I think there's a lot of folks that it, 
that aren't maybe as diehard about it that it will. It's kind of like, you know, if there's something you just casually do and and that gas prices might be the thing to push you over the edge. I think the diehards are going to say, yeah, that's what I do. I'm not going to let gas prices change what I do. But uh, um, I, I think there'll hmm. be people that will be affected. Oh, yeah. I, I think I'm going to be one of them, Kayla. Um, I think that uh, I love taking a trip. I like just seeing different country. I just love all the different spots. You can spring turkey hunt here in Nebraska since that spring tag is good statewide. It's archery, like we said, March 25th, uh, all the way to the end of it in May or middle of uh, April, the Saturday closest to April 15th each year. Then you can switch it over to the shotgun. I love trying these different birds, uh, ones that are in the open river valley or up in the Niobra or out west or down by uh, the southwest corner of the state because they just pop up in so many different places. And we've because of all that mixture of uh, genetics that we have in there too, you can have the, the thick wood, wood birds there on the eastern side of the state, uh, a little bit more open here in the middle, and then those that just seem to disappear. You see them miles away from trees out in the, in the Great Plains. Um, so we'll see. And it's not just the gas. I can't blame it completely on that, but that's going to be a big part of it. Um, you know, I've got a high school graduation going on this year. We've got, uh, two older, uh, kids and we did the year before that, uh, demands and time and, and, uh, money are going to go elsewhere as well. But I could see staying closer to home and maybe instead of going three hours away, it's 30 minutes away, uh, to chase birds as well. But, and, and it might impact, you know, I probably won't get three spring tags this year just because, nope. hey, you got a tag in your pocket. You're a turkey hunter. Turkey season's open. You go turkey hunting. It's not a, not a question of are you going turkey hunting today? Just like, well, yeah, yep. all those variables line up. So I definitely see uh, last year we spent some time up on Niobrara. It uh, came close to closing the deal a couple of times. Really, we were talking about going back up that direction, but it might end up just down the road. Down the street. What about you, Kayla? Of course, you got a wedding tossed in, in right in the in middle turkey season, I might of add. turkey season. <laughs> that that might have more impact than the gas. Scrutinizing decision making, but I'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, like we've kind of talked about on previous episodes, I'm very new to all this hunting stuff. I grew up, went deer hunting just a handful of times, and less than that would be pheasant, and then even less than that would be turkey. So I'm kind of new to this i don't exactly know all the tricks and all that so it takes a little longer for me to get out there i can't just walk out and be like this is turkey season this is where i'm going i have to really put in a lot more dedication and time just because i'm i don't know what i'm doing i haven't been doing this for 10 15 years so not knowing anything has never stopped the three uh, of us. Nope, yeah, nope. That don't, certainly I, can't be the prerequisite <laughs> I, hope. I, I wasn't saying that it stopped me it's just <laughs> <laughs> so I'm planning on getting out, but I don't know how much time I'll actually be able to dedicate to it. Yeah, yeah it's well, I know you spend a lot of time with your dog, which is great. It's a Springer. You, yep. They're fun spending time with. Uh, and turkey hunting and Springers don't necessarily go hand in hand. You know, mm. I have a friend who said she takes her dog hunting with her for every season. And I think Jaeger could do it, you know. I know some people that do as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not saying it's the best idea, but... Because uh, those springers don't like seeing birds on the ground. No, they, they really much don't. They much prefer to see them in the flight, you know, going the other way, making noise. His hardest part is not going after them and chasing them. He, yeah. he does not like to sit. That's the hardest part for him for waterfowl hunting. Same for is me. He yeah. has yeah. to sit, yep. <laughs> and the same. I, having owned a few springers, I know their sit it means it's different than it is in labs. I mean, they lab, it's a full contact. I'm 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 down. With springers, there's about six inches between their butt and the and the ground when you say stead. It's more of a just kind of a crouch a hunch, yep. than everything else, so they can spring forward and, and go. But it is. It, but that's an excellent point for those that this is going to be their first spring turkey season. Uh, you know, that probably isn't going to factor in as much because it's an adventure. It's fun. Get out there and, and do it. Now, if I do go, I'm spending more time out there. It's not going to be one of those I drive two hours and spend, you know, a day and a half and then come back. It's, it's going to be a couple of nights. Cause, hey, you can justify spending a night at the campsite or getting a hotel or a cabin or some some place like that to extend the fun out there. But you'll, you'll you're going to be in good turkey hunting spots. 
You really are. That's the nice I'm thing excited. about Nebraska. You don't have to go far if you don't want to. Well, think back to when you started turkey hunting in, in the state, Jeff. Everybody went north, right? Yeah. Yeah. The Niobrara was where you had to go, unless you want to go to the Pine Ridge. Niobrara was where you had to go. And so uh, that's where I cut my teeth on turkey hunting. And it was just it was just an adventure, I can tell you that. Um, and that, that started a lot for me. That started a lot. And then we kind of hit kind of our golden era. And uh, you probably saw fewer people going up that because they didn't have to travel as far. They were seeing them down out in the country just outside of town. Yep. They were yep. seeing it down on the, you know, the, the family's farm, whatever. Places where we hadn't seen turkeys before, didn't even think it was possible. They were now there and, and sometimes in numbers. Um, it is uh, the gas prices affecting, obviously, shed hunting. It's not probably affecting you going out to the farm, but your distance. I mean, you've traveled, what? couple hours away three or four hours away to go shed hunting already this year got another trip in you to go that far yes there you go (laughs) (laughs) unless unless something crazy happens in gas i mean it's high right now don't get me wrong taking the car though instead of the truck yeah uh, we've already uh yeah me and my wife have already had that discussion on the truck will probably be getting driven less and less and so and that's a great ad- adaptation. A turkey yeah. fits in a in a pretty small compact vehicle. I have found that out <laughs> more she than once. Be, she'd and, be really pissed if I put a deer in it. A turkey, I, I could probably get away. You with. get away with the turkey. Yeah. That's pretty bag of turkey. <laughs> you know, yeah. a deer. Eh, yeah, that's commitment. Yeah. <laughs> if you plan right, you can get a deer in the back seat of most vehicles. Oh, yeah. You have to plan right though. I'm I'm not saying you couldn't, <laughs> but you better be just uh, make sure it's dead. You better clean sure. it up better than a crime scene. <laughs> I, I'm not sure you you take a lot of pictures of it or tell a lot of people, especially those with loose lips. But it can be done. <laughs> I don't think I'd lead with that. I don't, no. I think that's, I don't think that's going to buy you any points, honey. Look, I cleaned up the back seat really well. Yeah, you can just barely smell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is no really well. You yeah. saw the car. <laughs> that tarsal gland scent does yeah, not come out. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 not not a chance. Yeah. Oh boy, yeah. Uh, the, the 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 ruddy buck smell does not help the upsell value. Probably not. Yeah, you know. Hershey's over there. Loose lips sink ships. So you don't need to worry about loose lips. She'll know if there was a deer in the back of the car. Uh, you know that that'd be a good thing to to know from our either our listeners, watchers, or our hunter ed instructors. You know what what one of those little pine trees that you hang from your rear view mirror covers the smell of of deer in rut that's been in the back seat better than any other i bet there's some good things that kind of mix up with that so you can just say well yeah that you, what you're smelling hey it's it's that ugly tree say, right if, there. if you got a good story or pictures <laughs> even better yet pictures <laughs> drop them in the comments i want to i, I want to yeah. see these yeah <laughs> how we get our deer home yeah yep. I, I do remember having to use the kids' pool every once in a while, the little wading pool that we'd get and <laughs> stuff like that to get deer into a car, but uh, that's that's a story for another time. So, Well, we've got lots of things coming up in the state of Nebraska. I know we're going to get into uh, turkey hunting here. We're going to have some learn-to-hunt stuff going on as, on as well. We'll probably mention a time or two here as well as some Facebook live feeds as far as Q&A session uh, as we get closer to the, the shotgun season. But I think we need to put a fork in it right here uh, and save some of that uh, for the, the days and weeks to come. We're getting pumped up for it in some warm weather. Definitely going to get us more in that that way. So uh, let's call it good until next time. Hunt Nebraska, brought to you by your Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Thank you.